Hi, my name is Steph Bastian and welcome back to the Tattoo Tales podcast. As you might know, this week we're working on a new charity project called Off The Wall. The aim of this project is to put the spotlight back on flashes, which are a foundation of traditional tattooing. For this project, we are going to have a group of some of the most talented and experienced tattooers around the world. The tattoo museums and collectors have provided us with a great catalog of classic vintage flashes that they possess. Every artist is gonna execute one specific design during the week 21st, 27th of March, and will donate their time so that instead of getting paid, the money that the customer will pay will go directly to a charity called Global Giving to bring some relief to the families affected by the war in Ukraine. I would like to personally thank Dana Brunson, Paul Rumsbottom, known as Rambo, Darren Bray, Lol Hardy, Dr. Ole Whitman, Andreas Conan, Jason Brooks, Gabriele Donini, and Aaron Blunquist for providing us with flashes and designs that we are going to use in this uh, off the wall project. Thank you very much for making this project possible. So in this series of interviews, which is part of the project, we want to talk a little bit about Flash, where it comes from, what it means from those artists, and include a little bit of tattoo history so that we can know a little bit better uh, where things come from. If you would like to get tattooed and contribute to this project, you can just go on Instagram on the page Steph Bastian Presents, which is Steph underscore Bastian underscore Presents, which is the page where we run all the projects. And you can see all the info and details when, uh, about when the list of artists will be released, who is going to tattoo, where, what, how much, this and that, so that you can support this idea and this cause. In this episode, we have the legend, Lal Hardy himself, and Dr. Ole Whitman. Lal Hardy, well, he doesn't really need much of an introduction, but uh, every time we have a chat, he blows my mind. He has so much knowledge and an incredible memory, so every time it's like a history class. In this one especially, he mentioned English tattooers that perhaps don't have enough recognition as they would deserve. So definitely you need a notepad when you listen to this because it will be very interesting for you to look up these people. And uh, Dr. Ole Wittmann is a, is a German historian which dedicated most of his life to reconstruct the life of uh, Christian Warlich, a tattooer that operated in Hamburg. And he provided us with a beautiful flesh from, uh, from Warlich. So it's definitely an episode rich of information. So I hope you enjoy. And if you like the podcast, please... Go on Spotify or iTunes, give us five stars. It would mean the world to us to reach more people and help support the show. Thank you very much and enjoy the episode. My name is Lau Hardy. I'm a tattoo artist of 40 plus years working in North London. Um, yeah, just been around this amazing trade for a very long time, for a lifetime, in fact. Yeah, you are the trade. <laughs> uh, you know, there's a lot of people now that are starting to get recognition, though, who didn't have it, which is good, you know, through the podcasts and through interviews and things. So, it's nice to see some of the unsung heroes starting to get um, recognition for their contributions to tattooing. And it's interesting that, we, you know, with social media as it is now, for all the negatives about it, there's some real positives and there's some people out there have really embraced researching, whether it's individuals or periods of tattoo history. Um, so for those that are interested in it, it's at the best point it's ever been to to get your research and to to fill your minds with knowledge. Yeah, and uh, going back going back to the flash, right, which is pretty much the point of this uh, of this project. First of all, would you like to mention the friend of yours, you know, that that recently passed? Would you like to give a little bit of a mention to her? Of her, I mean. Basically, there's a guy called Terry Manton. He runs a site called Scottish Tattoo History, um, very thorough researcher. And in his research, just before lockdown, he discovered a lady who, on social media, we knew her as Dot Shaw. But between 1958 and 1972, she tattooed under the name of Dorothy Haywood in Blackpool in Lancashire, English seaside town. She worked alongside Prince Eugene, who was a very famous tattooist in that part of the world. 
And most of her flash was just done in black and red. They were the two colours that they had. It was a very busy time. Um, so tattoos were fast. They were put on fast and quick for the people that used to travel to Blackpool. In Britain, we used to have um, fortnights or two weeks when factories would close down and people would go to the seaside town, spend their holiday there before air travel. So these places were busy, really, really busy. And after she was rediscovered by Terry, um, I started corresponding with her, as did a few other tattoo artists. And she started to redraw her flash, which has got this beautiful aesthetic to it. Um, as I said, mainly black and red, occasionally a little bit of green. And we had nearly two years of corresponding with each other and exchanging designs. And it was just an amazing time, amazing person to meet, albeit just through phone and letters. And sadly, the passage of time caught up with Dot and she passed away before we could meet up. But I've been very fortunate that many of my clients love her work so much that I've been able to replicate lots of her old designs onto them, you know? Yeah, yeah I see those swallows, those red and uh, they just send me black and red swallows. Yeah. And, um, and you've been a collector as well for a long time. So you very you have known Flash for, I guess, you know, most part of your life. And uh, what do you say that is the thing that, let's say you like the most or that we should treasure the most about Flash, you know, especially being a collector yourself? Well, it's quite funny, really, because I was reading an old interview I did where I said I absolutely hated doing Flash. It was at the time <laughs> when everyone was trying to do what, back in the 1980s, what they called custom work or, you know, our sort of, western version of japanese work and fantasy work there were so many different things happening the 1980s were were a whirlwind of influences you know i mean nowadays there's so many beautiful types of tattooing so many different genres but back then many of these were being fed to us you know we, we didn't have the internet we were just getting photographs and magazines and so i, I went away from flash for a while but i found that now so much flash has been rediscovered i like the way that it was redrawn by people. And sometimes you still see the same mistakes that was in the original Flash being made in, in the contemporary Flash. But it, it tells a history of tattooing. And there were so many artists who, if those artists hadn't have created their Flash, there would have been many poor tattoo artists. I mean, if you look at the work that was drawn by Graham Townsend from Portsmouth, which a lot of it went under the name of Ron Ackers, Roy Proudlove, who tattooed in Crewe in England. Um, it, it, Paul Rowlett from Derbyshire. These guys all drew flash that all of us had. Ian of Reading. Um, you know, these sheets of ready-made flash were there for us. And it's just the way that they've been passed down and redrawn through the generations. And now we've got artists that their, their skill level of executing everything is so beautiful. The renaissance of, of flash is amazing, you know. And it's quite interesting to see countries as well, like Spain and Italy um, and some of the South American countries. When I'm looking on Instagram and I'm seeing these artists who they've embraced this art form and, and just taken it to a new level. It's incredible to see. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, like you said, it's never been as good as now in, for certain things, right? Yeah, I mean, it's like everything, you know, people like old fashioned cars, but the best performance cars you can buy are now. You know, it's yeah. great to watch black and white films, but televisions are at the best they've ever been, you know, with flat screen HD. Everything moves on, but we can still embrace the past and bring it to the future and celebrate it. Yeah, yeah, that's one of the things that I like with you being, even if you're like, you know, what you would call an old timer. So you had significantly contributed, you know, through a long time, but you're not stuck in those days. You know, you really enjoy whatever comes that can help you bring that, in the in the in the new era like tradition and innovation both yeah but i mean you can be an old timer just because of the age you've reached but inside you can still be like a real youngster and embracing and loving everything that's happening and that can be from music to books to trends maybe not fashion i probably would look a bit silly in really tight trousers you know above my ankle and that. but in, in many things um you know age should not be a barrier to keep your mind working, to keep like learning and, and finding things that that kind of get your creativity going, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it takes humbleness though. 
You know, it's not that, it sounds simple, but it's not that common. And um, one thing that I like on the subject is that what Andreas Conan said recently, it was saying that, for example, talk about punk, he says, when I go see a concert, I want the, I go to a concert and maybe I don't understand half of the things that they're doing. Because it's, if it's something exactly like I used to like when I was 20, he said, that there's nothing new. So I'm like, oh, that's a, that's a very cool way to put it. Yeah, I mean, going back to, to what Andrews was saying there, I mean, in the 1970s and 80s, you know, the music scene was so, the music, fashion and subculture scene was changing so rapidly that despite what people would tell you that they were just into one sort of music, you'd often see like punks at a certain other gig or teddy boys at another gig. You know, we were charging around, going to all the different clubs, pubs, you'd get word that there was a band playing. You go and see a band and they just blow your mind, you know? Um, and that, that's the thing. Just enjoy it. Life's about enjoying things, not psychoanalyzing everything. You know, if you look at a picture and you like that picture, you don't have to give a, a, a kind of lecture on why you like it. Sometimes it's just because you like it. Yeah. Explain doesn't make it better. Um, uh, in your in your expertise, what would you say that makes a good flash? Well, I think with a good flash, what makes it is if the person who wants to wear it looks at it and they just think, wow, I want that on me. If it's a, a kind of a powerful image, the first tattoo I ever got was a panther's head with a dagger behind it. And I can remember I went into that shop and I looked at everything. I was with a friend who was being tattooed. Uh, I wasn't being tattooed that day. I went home and then... In my mind, this picture kept coming in there. It was actually a real driving force because the next week I just went back there. I had to have that piece of flash. I mean, I think with a it, flash can be so many things. I mean, you can see the stuff that's like Sutherland McDonald style, early Birchett style that is really single needle, very fine line. Or we can see the guys that use minimum amount of, of colors. They knew how to put black into maximum effect big, strong lines. Um, I mean, I, I actually like so many different types of flash. I don't think I could actually say there's one particular artist's work who would be my go-to person all the time. I mean, you look at some of Sailor Jerry stuff and Brooklyn Joe Lieber, and you're just like, wow, look at that, you know? And then you can see some of the 70s stuff that Roy Proudlove drew in, in England, and you're like, wow, that's got such a, an aesthetic to it that, that you're drawn to it. Yeah. And uh, what would you say, even if you just said that, but what would you say some of your favorite British tattooers? Maybe some people that, you know, they're not so well known like Sailor Jerry might be, right? But you're like, okay, if you know about England, you, you know that these people really, you know, contributed. What would you, what would you say? Rich Miggins, who, who tattooed in Halston, he was called the Dean of, of London Tattooing. His work was absolutely incredible. Uh, Cash Cooper produced uh, a lot of flash that was really, really good. There was a guy called Pete Tracy in Stanmore. His work and his designs are beautiful. Um, I mean, it's really hard to say because George Boney is still tattooing now. When I first went to George's shop, it was all flash on the walls, all beautifully drawn and presented. Dennis Cockle's first studio that was uh, in London in the Finchley Road. I mean, a lot of his stuff was Sailor Jerry based, but it was beautifully drawn, beautifully like mounted on the walls. And that. So you walked in there and you saw it. I mean, Birchett's early stuff is just, you know, superb. Um, they, they, honestly, there's so many of them. It's just hard to, to, when you start thinking, you get more and more names. Mickey Sharps, Mickey Sharps was drawing great flash and doing really, really super bright color tattoos in the seventies and eighties. And, uh, what do you have fun with these days? You know, because you were, because that's the thing, when you do a certain thing for a long time, then eventually you change every now and then and you try and mix things up. Like you were doing those bills. Like what do you have fun painting? Well, at the minute I have this uh, apprentice who's working for me called Mangetsu, this girl. She is an absolute machine at painting. So she's given me a kind of a new interest because I feel guilty that when I go to work each day, she's drawn a, you know, a painting or a sheet of flash. So I'm still doing the banknotes um, and I'm just working on, it's going to be because I like my old punk rock stuff. I'm working on a fundraising picture for Ukrainian charity, which will be based on 
images of Ukraine, but with a punk style. Um, I just painted some sheets of flash up as presents for people because I know they like my old stuff. So it's a kind of modern twist on the old punk stuff. Um, I do a bit of everything. I did a watercolour painting as a wedding present for someone the other day. Um, I, it just depends how I feel on the day, what I'm going to do, you know. And uh, La, this is always like a, a class history with you. <laughs> There's loads of stories. I mean, my, the, the thing is with the podcast, most of it, because I say the 80s was the golden era, I need to start to look through my collection and my books, my diaries and photos because there's whole other periods of time that really have gone unreported. I mean, if we look at the, the tattoo world, most people think traditional work was Sailor Jerry because Mike Malone and Ed Hardy did an incredible job in actually documenting what Jerry did. But we know there were other people and there's periods. I mean, it, within tattooing, there's been so many mad things. No one ever talks about the Celtic times or the tribal armband times, you know, the dusk till dawn times or acid house and different stuff that came along. There's, you know, there's periods of time that have been sort of almost forgotten that happened in tattooing, the super bright wizards, when wizards were all the things and Tasmanian yeah. devils and that, you know, when JD Crow was doing his tattoo flash, when everyone was buying that flash, Cherry Creek, most people don't even know who Cherry Creek was, but you remember everyone was doing the Cherry Creek designs. They were really important things in the 90s for people. And so there is still lots of stuff to be reported out there and, and to be remembered. If you would like to have a, again, like a longer chat about things that haven't been touched, you know, let me know. One day awesome. we'll do it. <laughs> All right, Lal. Thank you so much. Okay. All right. Well, listen, good awesome. luck with everything. Let's make it work. Yeah. Definitely. Definitely. Okay, my man. Perfect. See you soon. Awesome. Bye. 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 Hello, Ole. Hi. <laughs> How are you? Oh, pretty good. Pretty good. Nice. Um, You're in Hamburg, right? Yes, I'm in uh, close to Hamburg. Um, yeah, in my home office. <laughs> nice, nice. And, nice uh, and chill. And how did you end up doing what you do? Where did you, when did you get into the tattoo thing? Well, I actually, um, I studied art history. And um, at the time where I, I the, the master degree was closed, um, at that time in my life, I also started collecting tattoos. That was around, yeah, 2005, 2006. Yeah. And um, then I thought, well, how is it actually about tattoos and art history? Of course, I was asking myself that. And um, then I found out pretty quickly that there was hardly any um, art historical research on tattoos. And um, that's, that's why I started like looking around and, and doing some research and um, ended up with um, writing my PhD thesis about tattooing in, in art. Mm. So what um, was the nuance? What was the nuance of your PhD? Like, was it focused more on the, on the type of art form it is or more like in the, how you evolved? What was the, it was actually the um, about the um, iconography of tattoos um, the um, the material specific aspects of tattooing and the process of, of making a tattoo and um, yeah that was like the the the, the main uh, work um, that was in the center of the of the thesis was um, this piece by Damien Hurst uh, um, but it was called Butterfly Divided it was uh, created by Damien Hurst tattooed by Mu Coppoletta. Um, on the vulva of, of uh, a bearer of the tattoo, Shauna Taylor is her name. And Edi Sliman, I don't know if I pronounce it correctly, I think Edi Sliman, the photographer, he, he took a photo. And the, the, the work, of course, was interesting because so many people were involved and um, uh, the mode of presentation was discussed. And, um, and then I also, of course, since it was a butterfly tattooed on, on the vulva, I, I 
um, yeah, research about the iconography of the butterfly in art history and tattoo history as well. And, um, and that's how I also came up with, uh, well, well, came to Christian Wahlig because I remembered, oh, well, there's this Wahlig flash book, this little blue book, a lot of tattoos yeah. know. And, and I knew well the originals are in the Museum of Hamburg History in Hamburg. And then I looked at the original book um, in order to, to do the research. And there was a, a, a big surprise in many different ways because first the book itself was much bigger, like four times bigger than the little blue book. And the quality was amazing because the reproductions everybody knew from the fiddle book were really not of a very high quality. And then there was also a lot of other stuff about, um, well, from the estate of Christian Wahlig and other Hamburg tattooists. And there was no extensive research ever done on that stuff. And then I thought, well, cool, that's um, after I've done my, my PhD, that will be an interesting research project to do on this state of Wahlig and Hamburg tattoo history. And that's how the project Nachlass Wahlig uh, uh, was born. Because wow. Nachlass is the German word for estate. So it's like the estate of, of Wahlig, yeah. Yeah. That's what time was, uh, was uh, Wahlig uh, operating through? Um, well, he, he's, he was born in 1891 um, and he's supposedly started tattooing at school already uh, to do his friends uh, like uh, on his on a uh, little uh, poking and uh, but he started professionally in Hamburg around 1919 okay and, and did he stay uh, there all the time or moved he around stay, he or? actually well between um, 1905 and 1919 he traveled around um, he went to the United States as a stoker on, on passenger ships. And um, he also tattooed in Dortmund, for example, in Germany. And we yeah, have traveled around and then in 1919, he settled in Hamburg and um, stayed there till he died in 1964. Okay. And tattooed That's crazy. at the same place uh, for more than 40 years. <laughs> wow. It's crazy because I interview for the podcast people you know, amongst other things, I tried to put an accent on, on tattoo history because, uh, you know, I think it's it's very en enriching to to know more about where things come from. And uh, so I interview people that do similar things, similar type of work that you've been doing uh, in different countries, you know, like uh, Chuck Eldridge, uh, Terry Manton, you know. And it's interesting because you guys are like uh, investigative journalists, you know. Yeah. You had to find a little trace like Terry was yeah. saying that he looked into um, uh, um, newspaper articles in archives. And uh, Chuck was saying that he looked at, uh, for example, like the city hall planning or like uh, bills or something. So you could see where that person was living, depending on the contract that Definitely, they had renting. Yeah. So, yeah, it's yeah, crazy. Yeah. You look at, you look at um, birth certificates, marry, marriage certificates in order to, find out if they have descendants or not, because that's very often very important regarding the rights uh, of the copyrights and stuff like that. And I spend a lot of time in archives of, of museums, of, of cities, um, uh, in order to find traces of Wahlig or other Hamburg tattooists or uh, at the business register uh, to, to see if a tattooist maybe even registered his business. Uh, and uh, yeah, all, all kinds, uh, which of course is also like a, a, um, a statement when somebody registers this craft as a real business in 1961 or something. Um, so yeah, it's it's really, yeah, it, actually it's even better than investig investigative journalists, at least when you do research because, or you have a research project because you have even more time. Because mm. the problem of with journalists is very often they don't have so much time to do research, a lot of research for the article. So they, of course, can't go so much in depth like, like a researcher, of course. So, um, yeah. so that was like a huge privilege. I, I was able to uh, uh, do research on Bali for like five years straight. Uh, wow. So, yeah, so. <laughs> Have you managed uh, to like, um because the, the thing that sometimes people like yourself do, then they manage to track down descendants or yeah. people connected to the family and stuff like that and then they sometimes even who was it i think maybe terry was saying that 
you know, they found like a, a grandnephew or something and they had mm-hmm. like a box of something forgotten and inside were like crazy letters or whatever. Yeah. Have uh, you, have you... Same, same, same here, yeah. I, uh, I was able to find the, the step uh, grandson of Valich and um, he, he also had a, a passport left from Valich and um, some photos. And that was also really, really uh, of real high value because there was like some uh, uh, amazing information um, um, in those documents because very often in tattoo history, uh, you read stuff and, but there's nowhere real proof of the thesis that are written. And same with Valich, there were so many things um, that were written down in, in, in some books, but there was no real proof given. Like, for example, Valich used to be uh, uh, like a stoker, no? went uh, as a seafarer, went to the United States. But for all those things, there was no proof at all. And uh, luckily, um, I was able to find a couple of uh, hard proof. Uh, some nice. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so when course. you find those things, it must be like a Christmas. Oh and yes, you definitely, find definitely. Yeah. yeah, it was, it was like amazing. Oh, I I found the uh, the, the only uh, video footage of Valich and uh, stuff like that, and that's like you really like Christmas and birthday at the same day, <laughs> <laughs> all at once. And clearly, like because we're doing this project about flashes at the moment to kind of to revive and uh, to put a spotlight again on this uh, art form. And uh, the cool thing, I mean, they have many layers right but the, one of the cool things is that through the flashes i think is a channel for tattooers that when they get more into it especially about one specific artist or something that's like a almost like a door towards getting to know the the artist more and then eventually like yourself maybe not to that level but you know uh, getting more detailed information to get to know actually the character and, and and understand better not only the way they draw things but the whole context that generated it right yeah, definitely. You, um, yeah, I, I, the, the one thing that's really interesting that the, the, the tra- Western traditional tattooists, like the, the images or the motifs, are like 95% the same images, but every tattooer t- or tattoo artist uh, puts his own um, style, his own, uh, cr- his own uh, in German, yeah, we say handwriting in Germany, like his own uh, yeah, his, his style uh... into it. It's flavor. Uh, yeah, it's flavor. And yep. uh, that's like the interesting stuff. So you have an image which pops up at every flesh sheet uh, for, for every tattoo almost from that time, but you can still say, okay, that's definitely a Valich piece. Uh, so that's pretty amazing. And what was so interesting about the Valich um, book also is that there are some images in there which do not uh, pop up uh, so often in the flesh books of other tattooers of the time. Like that's also the reason why, for example, here this famous uh, Valich image with the demon, that's why this is on the book because this is not only a traditional flesh, but also very specific for Valich. So everybody who's uh, who's, uh, uh, into the tattoo scene uh, refers this images image to Valich right away so that's also the reason why that was picked for the book so yeah that's the one thing that I found really cool and also which is so interesting is that the whole development uh, how flesh came up is so cool because before uh, of course there was no flesh because uh, tattooists were um, it was like a, a, a yeah, a mobile uh, kind of uh, uh, job. Um, you tattooed wherever you you had people who want to get tattooed in the park, in the pub, in on the ship. Um, and at that point of time, the flash books were also only of the size because they had to be mobile, and um, there was no need for flash sheets or something like that. And um, and at about yeah, when in Germany, Balich and Kai Finke were the, the first tattooers who really settled down and had a public kind of a tattoo studio. And then they had the opportunity to hang something uh, on their walls. And that's how, how flash came up. And that's also so interesting because this is the original size of Balich's flash book. And uh, that's pretty large. And that's uh, because it was sitting there on the counter of his pub because he hadn't, didn't have to carry it around so it could be bigger than before. So, that's, uh, so you can see actually how the craft changed um, due to the flesh. If somebody would like to know more about Marlich, right? Yeah. What, um, what would you recommend and uh, where can they find more of his work and then the, your work of reconstructing his story, what would you recommend 
you know, particular publications, you know, whatever. Yeah, the, 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 the first uh, step would be the Wahlich book. It's called uh, Christian Wahlich Tattoo Flash book. And that's um, the reproduction of Wahlich, uh, Wahlich's famous uh, um, flash book and um, the text with my main research uh, stuff and it's also in English so it's a bilingual book so um, we, uh, we did it in English as well because um, of course so everybody has uh, the opportunity to read about it yeah. and um, yeah that will be the first step and then of course there's a very interesting publication it's called um, Die Tätowierung in den deutschen Hafenstädten which is uh, tattooing in German port cities And it's mm -hmm. a publication from 1933. It's in German, but that's very interesting because the author, Adolf Sparma, uh, uh, writes about uh, tattooing in Germany in that time, in the beginning of the 20th century, uh, the, especially Northern Germany. That's pretty cool. Nowadays, it's, it's not that difficult. I mean, when you find the stuff as a PDF online, you can translate it with Google Translate or whatever. It's yeah. like uh, it's super easy. So that's a real nice publication for everybody who wants to know more about tattooing in Germany in the early 20th century. And um, the, for everybody who missed the exhibition, the, I, I curated the Wahlich exhibition at the Museum of Hamburg History, which was in the end of 19. 2019 and beginning of 2020 and on the Nachlass Wahlich homepage nachlasswahlich.de there's a virtual um, tour you can you can walk through the exhibition you can't see the details and the text and everything really well but you can at least have an, an, an impression of what was exhibited and what what were the topics of the exhibition oh, nice. and um, so that's uh, maybe interesting and um All kinds of different topics are, of course, uh, within the Instagram posts on the Nachlass Wahlich uh, Instagram profile. Yeah, that's um, the, the um, publication about Karl Finke, which was like uh, somebody who worked at the same time as Wahlich in Hamburg. Um, that's also pretty interesting. It's called Buch Nummer 3, Book Number 3. Um, and that's also bilingual, German, English. Um, so yeah, that's, I think that's where, that are the biggest points uh, to start with. And of course, whoever wants to know details can always write me, of course. <laughs> And uh, where people, how can people get in touch with you? Oh, they can just uh, go on the Nachlass Wahlich uh, uh, homepage and uh, write me an email or uh, write me a message on, on Instagram. Um, yeah. Would you mind to spell, especially for people maybe... Uh, they, they, they don't uh, let's say Americans and stuff. Would you mind to spell the, the Instagram? Yeah, the Instagram is um, Nachlass. So if I don't want to say anything wrong, so it's yeah, Nachlass.Valix. So that will be N A C H L A S S dot Valich, W A R L I C H. Nachlass Wahrlich. Awesome. A Nachlass awesome. is the German word for estate. It's not the first name. It's uh, the first name okay. of Malik is Christian. <laughs> awesome. And uh, are you working on something like any, for any time soon? Are you working for some project for the future? Yeah, right now I'm um, mainly working on a, on a, a business project which is um, Wahrlich Rum, actually, which is a, a rum uh, I invented for the exhibition. Uh, um, that was the first idea because, this, uh, because he had a grog. Uh, um, his pub where he tattooed was a place where he served grog, which was pretty common in harvest cities in, the, in that time, just made of rum, hot water, and sugar. And that whole um, topic was also part of the exhibition. And that's why um, I thought, well, it would be cool to have a rum for the museum shop during the yeah. exhibition time to sell it there. And that went pretty well. And uh, so I started expanding and also offering the, the, the product in, in, in nice uh, uh, supermarkets and stuff like that in Hamburg. And um, the, actually the, the big plan behind this is that for, um, from every bottle sold, one euro is uh, donated to the Institute for German Tattoo History. Um, I work there um, as a voluntary researcher. And um, so the idea is that one day when really a lot of bottles uh, are sold per year, there will be enough money to be able to, uh, to hire like a, a researcher a full-time researcher to, to do research on German tattoo history. 
of course, we also start. So um, it's me and Manfred Kors from the Tattoo Collection Kors. And uh, we do, uh, we are working on a project um, on Horst Streckenbach, who was a German tattooist after Wadelig. So um, the, the generation after Wadelig. And um, yeah, so there one day, uh, I hope uh, there will be a book coming uh, on Horst Streckenbach. And um, yeah, so, so we are kind of the, the Wahlig project kind of is, a, is, a, is supposed to be a blueprint for following projects on other German tattooists. Nice, nice. Looking forward to, to see what, what happens with that. Yeah, so am I. <laughs> amazing, amazing. And um, I go quite regularly to Copenhagen uh, now, even if I moved here because I have family and customers and stuff like that. So hopefully one day, you know, I, I send you a message, I come down and we have a beer. Yeah, that would be great. We actually, the place where, where uh, Balich worked, um, the building was not destroyed in the Second World War. And now there's okay. a, pub, a pub in there again. Uh, they're really interested in the history and everything. Uh, they also have some flash on the walls. I didn't uh, see it yet, but supposedly they put some photos and flash and stuff to, to remember Balich there. And so maybe that would be a great place to meet. Actually, at, the, at that exact place where, where Wahlich uh, worked. That would be dope. Thank you so much for, for this beautiful introduction because a lot of people are, uh, you know, are interested in this. And especially the younger tattooers, sometimes they don't know, apart from the internet, how to get certain types of information, or at least like mm -hmm. a direction. Be like, okay, look in that way, you know? So like, like you said, so I think it's a lot yeah. of information. So thank you so yeah. much for that. Yeah, my pleasure. And whoever wants more information, uh, just uh, don't hesitate to contact me. Awesome, awesome. Thank you so much, Dan. I'll let you know when I come that way. So definitely, Great. it would be nice to catch up. Thanks a awesome. lot. Bye-bye. Awesome. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>